Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of PMDG's tech team. Today's video is going to be a long one because we're discussing the electrical system of the 737NG. Now, this might also become a little bit boring because we um, have a lot of stuff going on in the background there which the pilot is actually not able to see and that the pilot actually not has a lot to do with. However, it is all simulated in the PMDG 737NG, so let's take a look and let's um, start off. First of all, in my airline we are using the dual battery package and that is actually the most common package seen. You will find this in the PMDG options in the um, ETOP section actually, which is a little bit strange to me, but anyway you're going to find it there. And um, everything that I'm going to talk about in this video is reference to the dual battery installation in the aircraft. So I'm not going to talk about a single battery installation here. However, you may be able to tell from uh, some of the diagrams shown how some of the stuff may work with a single battery installation. Also, it would further complicate the video and um, make things even longer if we talked about the single battery package as well. So I'm going to refer to what's most commonly used by the airlines, which is the dual battery package. So, let's start off then. Primary electrical power in the 737NG is provided by two engine integrated drive generators or IDGs. From here on, I'll continue to refer to them as IDGs. So Integrated drive generator is the word for that, which supply three phase 115 volts and um, 400 hertz alternating current. Each IDG supplies its own bus system in normal operation and call, can also supply essential and non essential loads of the opposite side when one IDG is inoperative. Transformer rectifiers or TRs, remember that one? And the main battery and uh, battery charger supply DC power to the airplane. The main and auxiliary batteries also provide backup power for the AC and DC standby system. And the APU operates the generator and can supply power to both AC transfer buses or on the ground in flight. There are two basic principles for the 737 electrical system. Number one, there is no paralleling of the AC sources of power. Number two, Never switch off a bus, only switch on new systems. Or to quote the FCOM, which makes it a bit more complicated in my opinion, the source of power being connected to a transfer bus automatically disconnects an existing source. To make it easy, just never switch something off on the electrical system, only switch stuff on, that's automatically going to switch off the previous um, provider. The electrical power system may be categorized into three main divisions. We have the AC system, the DC system, and the standby power system. But before we get to them, let's start with the electrical power generation. You can see already that I'm kind of following the uh, system in the AFCOM over here, so let's go from there. We'll start off with the engine generators. Primary power for the aircraft is obtained from the uh, two engine IDGs, and they maintain a constant generator speed throughout the normal operating range of the engine. And an integral electromechanical disconnect device, lovely Boeing word, provides for complete mechanical isolation of the IDG. So if the IDG switch is switched off, then the whole IDG is disconnected from the system and cannot be reconnected by the pilots, by the way. This has to be done by engineering on the ground. Well, obviously, I want to see the engineer doing that in flight. Poor little engineer. So, next up is the APU generator. The APU generator can supply power to both AC transfer buses on the ground or in flight. And as the only power source, the APU generator can meet electrical power requirements for all ground operation and most in-flight conditions. As a third option of um, AC power, we have the external ground power. So the external AC power receptacle is located below the uh, nose gear wheel well on the uh, right hand side of the fuselage, which is basically the one where you always see the um, handling agent plugging in the headset as well. So just below that is the ground power plug. 
You have a status light up here, which is the ground power available light, and that is automatically checking if the quality of the ground power meets the uh, requirements of the aircraft. And if it does, then the ground power available light is going to illuminate and the pilot can switch on the uh, ground power. And the ground power is able to supply both transfer buses. Finally, we have a ground service switch. So um, that one is located on the forwards attendant control panel next to the main door. And the switch provides ground power directly to the AC ground service bus for utility outlets, cabin lighting and the uh, battery charger without powering all airplane electrical buses. So this is basically a switch. If you push it, you're going to get lights and power in the cabin, but not in the flight deck. That's the easy way of saying what the ground service button is doing. Now, that one is uh, actually not simulated in the PMDG 737 because it is a flight attendant function to call it that way and the pilots have nothing to do with it. In fact, the switch is not even located inside the flight deck. All right, so let's have a look at the electrical power schematic. This looks fairly complex, doesn't it? And it is. So um, let's start with what the pilot can actually see. We have our battery and our auxiliary battery. So from the battery, we have a direct line to the APU starter, making APU start possible for as long as the battery is charged and on. Then we have our switched hot battery bus. The switched hot battery bus basically means that this is providing DC power, provided that the battery switch is on. Next up, we have our hot battery bus. Hot battery bus means that power is always available from the battery, regardless whether it's switched on or off. That is, for example, used for the uh, clock in the airplane or for operation of the um, fuel shutter valves, just as an example. From there on, we're going to the battery bus. And now things are getting more complex, because we also have the DC standby bus. And if we want to go the other way around, starting at the engines, we have generator number 2 feeding the uh, AC transfer bus number 2, generator number 1 feeding the AC transfer bus number 1, and we have an APU generator which can be uh, connected to both. Also, we have our external AC receptacle, which can be connected to the AC transfer buses, but which can also bypass the AC transfer buses if the ground service button is pressed. So, as we can see here, from the external power, if you bypass the AC transfer bus, it's only going into the um, AC ground service bus and into the auxiliary battery charger and the AC and to uh, charge the auxiliary battery. Same the other way around, it will power the um, AC ground service bus number two, and from there it's going into the battery charger to charge the normal battery. Now, provided that we are not using the uh, ground service, let's look at the um, power distribution then. Basically, we have our AC transfer buses, and we have our lights for them here as well. Let me turn on the um, light test switch. So we have our transfer bus off light in case the transfer bus is not powered. So the transfer bus number one is providing power to the uh, galley bus C and D and to the AC main bus number one and to the uh, transformer rectifier number one while the AC transfer bus number two is providing power to the AC main bus number two and the galley bus A and B. The AC transfer bus number 2 also provides power to the uh, transformer rectifier number 2. And the transformer rectifier number 3 can actually be switched between the two, but is usually connected to the AC transfer bus number 2. From here on, we have um, our cross bus tie relay, which can connect the uh, different TRs to the um, different buses. So TR number 1 by default is going to feed the DC bus number 1, while TR number 2 is going to feed the DC bus number 2, and TR number 3 
By default is feeding the DC bus number 2 as well, but with a crossbus tie relay can feed the DC bus number 1 as well. By default the crossbus tie relay is closed and is only going to open under certain circumstances, but we're going to get to that later. Also note that through the TR number 1 the DC standby bus is fed and it's also connected to the battery. Sounds complex, right? No worries. For normal operation of the IR plane, you don't really have to understand all of this. The main thing you should take away from here is... The generators are powering the transfer buses, and the transfer buses are then transferring power to the different systems. And this is important, because in case we have the transfer bus off-light illuminating, on the left hand side then we know that certain subsystems are not going to be powered and the same on the right hand side. So that's basically, those two lights are basically why you need to understand this um, schematic. But don't worry, you don't have to know it by heart. All that you have to know is where to find it. As always, knowing something means knowing where to find it. Let's go on then and talk about the AC power system. So, every AC power system consists of a transfer bus, a main bus, two galley buses and a ground service bus. The transfer bus number one also supplies power to the AC standby bus. And if the AC source powering either standby bus fails or is disconnected, the bus is automatically going to be uh, powered through, the, um, through other available sources by usage of the bus tie breakers. So we can see that up here, let's say our engine number one generator fails, then the bus tie breakers are automatically going to close and the transfer bus number one will be powered by the generator number two. So with the airplane on the ground and both generator control switches off, or with both engines shut down, selecting ground power on is going to connect external power to both transfer buses. Likewise, selecting either APU generator switch on connects the APU power to both transfer buses. So even though we have two APU generator switches up here, putting a single one on is already going to connect it to both transfer buses. However, it is not possible to power one transfer bus with the external power and another with the APU. So the transfer buses can be powered from the engine generators by switching them on momentarily and then letting the switch return into the middle position and that is going to um, extinguish the related light provided that everything is uh, working normally. When you do this, the generator circuit breaker is going to uh, close and um, that connects the generator to the respective transfer bus. If another source has been uh, powering both transfer buses and the engine generator is switched on, it is going, only going to um, power the transfer bus on the respective side and the external power or APU are going to continue to supply power to the remaining transfer bus. So let's say we are running on the APU and we switch on the uh, generator on the left hand side, then the left transfer bus will be powered by engine generator number one and the right transfer bus is going to be powered by the APU still. So, um, in flight, either engine-driven generator is um, normally powering its own transfer bus. But if that is no longer the case, so if, for example, the um, or one of the two engine-driven generators failed, or an engine failed, the bus tie breakers automatically close, allowing the other generator to supply both transfer buses through the um, tie bus and the BTBs, bus tie breakers. And the APU can power either or both buses through the BTBs. Note that when a failure of um, a system happens and the transfer bus is no longer being powered automatically um, through the source that it's been powered on previously, so if there has been an automatic switching, the source of light is going to illuminate to indicate that switching of the generator has occurred. Now, in normal operation, you are mostly going to see this if you shut an engine down for a single engine taxi, because then the transfer bus off-light may illuminate momentarily, 
now in the PMDG. It illuminates a bit longer than in the real plane, but we'll have to live with it. And then the source of light is going to illuminate, indicating that the left generator is no longer powering the left transfer bus, as has been the case previously. But the source of light is nothing to be worried about in this case, because it does indicate that the um, transfer bus is now being powered by another source, so in case of single engine taxi, probably by the um, remaining engine driven generator. Note that the system does incorporate an automatic generator online feature, which however only operates under one single condition. So remember what I told you earlier on the basic principle of the electrical power operation, never switch something off. So you always need to switch something on in order for it to take over. There is a single difference, however, and that is if you take off with the APU powering the electrical system. So that is mostly the case if you do a um, takeoff where the APU is um, used to pressurize the airplane so the engine bleeds are off. The Boeing word for that is a no engine bleed takeoff and you forgot to switch on the engine driven generators after the engine start because you have to keep the APU on. So if you're in the air and the APU is powering the uh, transfer buses and you then shut the APU down after when you are uh, reconfiguring for um, normal flight after the new engine bleed takeoff, then the engine driven generators are going to come online automatically. But that is the only case in which they come on automatically. And that is only in flight and um, under the circumstances described. So on the ground, the airplane is going to go dark. In the air, the engine generators are going to take over automatically. So I've already mentioned the bus tie system a couple of times, so let's have a quick look over it. So either engine driven generator or the APU can supply power to both transfer buses. If the bus trans switch is in the auto position and the source powering the transfer bus is disconnected or fails, then the source powering the opposite transfer bus automatically picks up the unpowered transfer bus through the bus tie breakers. That is basically what I have just described for the engine out case. We have a bus transfer switch over here. When, when the thing is guarded, the switch is always in the auto position. So there is no way to um, put this into off. If I close the guard now, then the guard by itself pushes the switch back into the auto position. So as long as this one is guarded, the automatic um, transfer is taking place through the bus tie system. Do note that there is an automatic load shedding feature for both the engine generators and the APU. However, they behave slightly different. So in case of the engines, for single generator operation, the system is designed to shed electrical load based on the um, actual load sensing on the system. So the galleys and the main bus on uh, transfer bus 2 are shed first. The galleys, well, alright, we are no longer going to get a hot coffee. That may be catastrophe if you're flying the BBJ on a long haul, but it is survivable on most short to medium haul flights. So we can live without the galleys. Even though you're probably going to cause a revolution in the cabin if you're flying for four hours to the Canaries without um, being able to supply the passengers with coffee. But that's for a different moment. You'll probably have different problems anyway when load shedding occurs. So, um, if an overload is still sensed after the galley buses and the main bus on uh, transfer bus 2 are uh, shed, then the uh, galleys and main bus on transfer bus number 1 are shed. And if the overload still exists, the uh, in-flight entertainment buses are shed as well. When configuration changes to a more source capability, so effectively that means to having another generator. For example, let's say an engine driven generator fails, you start the APU, a minute later the APU generator is available. Then the uh, load restoration to the respective buses is going to take place automatically. So basically there is full automatic operation there. However, you can try to manually restore the galley and main bus power by moving the cabin utility power switch on the overhead 
from uh, to the off position and then back on. Note that in the 700 over here we only have a galley power switch. We have no cabin utility power switch, but you are going to find that one in the 737, 8 and 900s once they are released. Next up, let's talk about the APU load shredding. So in flight, if the APU is the only source of electrical power, then all galley buses and main buses are automatically shed. If the electrical load is still exceeding the uh, limits, then both IFE buses are automatically shut as well. And on the ground, the APU will attempt to carry a full electrical load, but if an overload condition is sensed, the APU is automatically going to shut the galley buses and the main buses until the load is within limits. Manual restoration, once again, can be attempted by moving the cabin utility power switch off and on. So you can see, if we're talking about the engine generators, then the plane is only shedding what it um, has to shed. But if we're talking about the APU being the only power source, then it is automatically straight away shutting down the galley buses and the main buses. And only then, if electrical load still exceeds design limits, it is going to um, shed the IFE buses as well. So let's move on then to the AC power schematic and have a quick look at that one as well. We can see it over here. This one is rather easy, isn't it? Well, easier said than done, right? So, um, from here on we can see basically what we have explained earlier on in the um, full power distribution diagram already. So. AC transfer bus 1, powering galley bus uh, C and D, and the AC main bus number 1, and the AC standby bus, as well as the AC ground service bus. And number 2 is powering the main bus number 2, galley buses A and B, and the AC ground service bus. And with a ground service switch on the cabin attendant panel, you can bypass the um, transfer buses and simply um, power the ground service buses. So let's move on then to the electrical power control and monitoring. First of all, we have our generator drives. The IDGs contain the generator and the drive in a common housing. They're lubricated and cooled by a self-contained oil system. You can see I'm mainly telling you exactly what's in the AFCOM over there because that is just the best source of uh, information. Unless you want to go into the maintenance manuals, but that's for a different day. And probably not on this channel. So, in, and now comes the lovely Boeing word, an integral electromechanical disconnect device provides for a complete mechanical isolation of the IDG. So, when that happens, the uh, drive light, that is um, this one over here for number one and this one for number two, is going to illuminate when low oil pressure is sensed in the IDG. And IDG low oil pressure is caused by either an IDG failure, engine shutdown, automatic disconnect due to high oil temperature or disconnect through the uh, generator drive disconnect switch that's the red one we see guarded down here so don't press this unless you want to have fun with your engineers the uh, generator drive and disconnect switches will cause the um, complete disconnection of the idg and a reset is only possible by engineering on the ground so that's why these things are covered in red. The action is non-reversible. You flick the switch, the drive and the generators are gone for the remainder of the flight. There is no way to bring them back online. So the AC voltage and frequency may be read on the uh, volt and frequency meter for standby power, ground power, generator number one, APU generator, and generator number two, and the static inverters. Frequency is only indicated when the generator is actually electrically excited and the voltage regulator automatically controls the generator output voltage. We can see that up here. We are running the APU generator at the moment, so it's giving us the frequency and the voltage. Now, we're getting a zero indication on the engine generators because they are not online at the moment, because the engines are shut down in, um, while I'm recording this video. But we can see the um, APU is on even though it's not currently powering the buses. So you can see the generator of bus light is still showing. So the ground power is uh, currently powering the aircraft, but you can see the generator is available, so we're getting the information from it. 
Similarly for the ground power, for the standby power, and if we go on here, we're getting it from the inverters as well. Now, I'm not going to go over the test function because that is purely for maintenance. Um, basically, however, just a quick summary of the test function because we're at it. Um, what that does is to connect the voltage and frequency meter to the power system's test module for selection of um, additional reading points. But that's really all. Nothing pilots have to be concerned about. For the, D for the DC voltmeter and ammeter, that's the one on the left-hand side here. So right-hand side is AC, left-hand side is DC. Um, it's basically the same thing as on the other side. So we can select our different sources here. And um, test position once again only for maintenance. And the standby power and uh, battery bus displays only DC voltage. Going on then, let's have a quick look at the system schematic. And we have a dual battery package over here. So this is what it looks like then. Alright, so that basically concludes our look at the AC system. So by now we are like 26 minutes into the video and we still got the whole DC system and the standby system. So you can see this is getting a longer one. Let's go ahead then with the DC power system. It's based on 28 voltage supplied by three transformer rectifier units which are energized from the AC transfer buses as we saw on the um, system schematic earlier on. The battery is also providing DC power to um, so, sorry, I'm going to say that one again. The battery is uh, providing DC power loads um, only when no other source is available. Otherwise, the batteries are just sitting there on standby um, in case they are needed. So, on the ground, an ember ELEC light is going to come on to indicate that a fault exists in the DC power system or the standby power system, and the light is inhibited in flight. So, the ELEC light, let's put the light test on again, is the one we have up here, and... I would say that um, the most conditions when I've actually seen this light operating is when um, we had a power drop previously. So it happens from time to time that the ground power is just dropping out because the unit dies or because somebody is running over the cable and pulls the plug. And aircraft don't like that. It's just like with your computer. If you pull the plug and you put it back on, chances are you might encounter all kind of uh, problems. Now, in modern computers, that is not the case so much anymore, but keep in mind, we're talking about a 737 here. The thing's been designed in the 90s, and if you did that to a 90s computer, you are going to run into all kinds of problems. And that's exactly the case on the 737 as well. So, that's when I've seen the ELEC lights for most of the time. Now, there are a couple of uh, possible reset procedures that maintenance can guide you over, but normally, if that light is on, you're grounded. And if the light comes on in flight, then you should seriously think about if something is wrong, because the light should be inhibited in flight. So as I told you, the uh, main source of DC power in the system are the three transformer rectifier units that we have in the airplane. And they, confer they convert 115 volt AC to 28 volt DC and are identified as TR1, 2 and TR3. So while I'm talking about all of this, let's actually get the power schematic up so that you can follow along. So TR1 receives AC power from the transfer bus number 1, TR2 receives trans, uh, AC power from transfer bus number 2, and when the transfer bus switch is set to auto, TR3 normally receives AC power from transfer bus number 2, but has a backup source of AC power from transfer bus number 1. Any two TRs are capable of supplying the total connected load, so one of them might fail and you still have the... Um, and you still are incapable of providing full power. So under normal conditions, the DC bus number 1, DC bus number 2, and the DC standby bus are connected from the uh, cross bus tie relay. And in this conditions, TR1 and 2 are each powering DC bus 1, DC bus 2, and the DC standby bus. While the TR3 actually only powers the uh, battery bus and serves as a backup power source for the TRs number 1 and 2. Therefore, if uh, you're thinking about, so what should I set my uh, readings to up here? 
I would suggest to put um, it to TR number 3 because you're going to see if um, TR3 fails or sorry, if uh, TR3 is being put under an exceptional load that is an indicator that either number 1 or 2 has failed. So you can sort of monitor all three with the um, not only on the TR number 3 position because that is automatically going to give you um, information on the TR1s or 2 by looking at the loads. The trunk bus tie relay is automatically going to open and thereby isolate DC bus number 1 from DC bus number 2 under the following conditions, and this is an interesting one. At glide slope capture, during a flight director or autopilot ILS approach, and this isolates the DC buses to, during approach to prevent a single failure from affecting both navigation receivers and flight control computers. And of course, when the bus transfer switch is positioned to off. In flight, an amber TR unit light illuminates to uh, indicate a failure of the TR number 1 or TR number 2 and 3. On the ground, it illuminates for any TR failure. So, another reason here to keep the switch on TR number 3 if um, TR number 2 fails, you're not going to get an indication on the TR unit light, but only when 2 and 3 both fail, or if a single failure of the TR number 1 occurs. So, that's the uh, normal supply of um, DC power to the airplane during uh, ground or flight. Now, of course, we also have our batteries available. And, as said, I'm only going to talk about the dual battery package over here. So. The batteries in the 737NG are uh, nickel cadmium type batteries supplying 24 volts normally and you ha have a main and an auxiliary battery in the electronics compartment. The batteries can supply part of the DC system and the auxiliary battery operates in parallel with the main battery when the battery is powering the uh, standby system. At all other times the auxiliary battery is isolated from the power distribution system so basically not doing anything. Battery charging is uh, done automatically, as we have seen in the uh, diagrams earlier on already. So, as soon as the um, ground service buses are powered, the uh, batteries are going to be charging, and at any other moment when the um, TRs are operating, the batteries are going to be charging as well. So, um, the DC buses. Sorry, before we get into that, um, let's quickly talk about the duration and voltage of the batteries. So battery voltage is anywhere between 22 and 30 volts. Let's see what we have in our 737 here right now. 24 volts on the main, 28 on the auxiliary, to be expected. And fully charged batteries are able to provide standby power only for a duration of approximately 60 minutes with the dual battery package. So, a single battery is able to provide approximately 30 minutes. That's the reason, by the way, why most airlines have the dual battery package. That's because if a complete loss of AC power happens in cruise flight, and you don't have an airport in immediate um, vicinity, then the battery is only going to be able to power your systems for approximately 30 minutes. Afterwards, the airplane is going to go dark. Now. Without ETOPS certification, the 737NG, just like any other um, jet transport airplane, is allowed to fly 60 minutes from the nearest airport. So, imagine flying at night with a single battery package, and you have an AC power happening, and the next airport is like 45 minutes away. Then 15 minutes before you reach that airport, your airplane is going to turn dark. And to prevent that, most airlines have the dual battery package installed on the airplane. So, the DC buses are, that are actually powered from the battery after a complete loss of a generators are the battery bus, the DC standby bus, the hot battery bus, and the switched hot battery bus. But note that the switched hot battery bus is powered whenever the battery switch is actually on. So, the hot battery bus is always connected to the battery, as I've said earlier on in this video, and there is actually no switch in the circuit. So. As long as the battery voltage is above the minimum, the uh, units supplied by this bus are actually going to um, be powered. As said, this is mostly for stuff like the clocks, for example, um, which just always need power. 
There is a uh, battery discharge light installed up here, which indicates excessive battery discharge if detected. So the um, battery chargers then. The uh, main battery charger is, pro is uh, powered through the AC ground service bus number 2 and the auxiliary battery charger is powered through the AC ground service bus number 1. So the chargers provide a voltage output tailored to maximize the battery charge. So what you get in your uh, mobile phones nowadays where they say, yeah, this is for maximum charging, blah, 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 blah. That's what the 737 is doing since about 30 years. So, and uh, following completion of the primary charge cycle, the main battery charger reverts to a content voltage TR mode. And in the TR mode, it powers loads connected to the hot battery bus and switched hot battery bus. In other words, for as long as the chargers are operating they are, or are powered, let's call it that way, they're actually taking over the, the uh, job of the batteries themselves. So the batteries are just sitting there on standby waiting to um, be taken online in case a power failure happens. The uh, main battery charger also provides, uh, sorry, also powers the uh, battery bus if the uh, transformer rectifier number three fails, and with the loss of the AC transfer buses number one or the uh, source of power to DC bus number one, the AC and DC standby buses are going to be powered by the main and auxiliary battery or the battery chargers if available. So here again, the chargers are trying to power the system instead of the actual batteries for as long as they get um, sufficient power. And with the main battery, um, sorry, the auxiliary battery chargers and the uh, battery themselves are isolated from the power distribution system under normal operation. And when the main battery is powering the uh, standby system, the auxiliary battery is connected to operate in parallel with the main battery. So both of them are being used at the same time than if they have to be used. All right, that's the DC system. Easy, isn't it? All right, I know we are 37 minutes down the video, but we still have one more, and that is the standby power system. So let's bring up the uh, standby power system schematic over here with the dual battery package. No worries, guys, we are getting there. So normal operation of the standby power system um, it's going to provide 150 volt AC and a 24 volt DC power to essential systems in case of the event of loss of all engine or APU driven AC power. And the standby power system consists of the static inverters, AC and DC standby buses, the battery bus, hot battery bus, switched hot battery bus, main battery and auxiliary battery. During normal operation, the um, guarded standby power switch is an auto. That's the one that we can see uh, sorry, up here, of course. Yep, this is getting a long one. And my brain starts getting... Uh, starts farting every now and then. So, um... This basically... Uh, or this configuration basically provides alternate um, power sources in case of a partial power loss, as well as a complete transfer to battery power if all normal power is lost. Under normal conditions, the uh, AC standby bus is powered from AC transfer bus number 1, and the DC standby bus is powered from the transformer rectifiers 1, 2, and 3, and the battery bus is uh, powered by TR number 3, while the hot battery bus and the switched hot battery bus are powered by the battery or the uh, battery chargers under normal conditions. We do have an alternate operation, however. And the alternate power source for the standby power is the uh, main battery and the auxiliary battery. So with the standby power switch in the auto position, the loss of all engine and APU electrical power is going to cause the batteries to power the uh, standby loads both in the air and on the ground. The AC standby bus is uh, powered from the batteries via the static inverters, and the DC standby bus, battery bus, hot battery bus and switched hot battery bus are powered directly from the batteries. So we do have the uh, standby power switch over here to basically provide manual control. You can either have it in auto, off, or with the batteries uh, directly powering the system. In the auto position, automatic switching from normal to alternate power occurs if power from either AC transfer bus number one or DC bus number one is lost. And if you manually position the um, switch to the battery, it's going to override the automatic switching 
and is going to place the AC standby bus number one, uh, sorry, the AC standby bus, the DC standby bus, and the battery bus directly on battery power. The battery switch itself may be either on or off. If the battery switch is off, the switch top battery bus is not powered. If you put the switch into the off position, it's going to de-energize both the AC standby bus and the DC standby bus, and it's going to illuminate the standby bow, uh, the standby power off light that we can see right above the switch over here. Again, that is not being used by pilots, so that is the off position is maintenance function. We do have static converters in the airplane, and they do convert um, 24, 24 volt DC into 115 volt AC power to supply the AC standby bus during the uh, loss of normal electrical power. The power supplied to the inverter is controlled by the standby power switch and the battery switch on the overhead panel. So, with all generators inoperative, let's talk about which equipment we are still going to have in our airplanes. Provided that the main battery and the auxiliary battery are the only source of electrical power. So, we're going to have only very limited lights operating. It's only going to be the standby compass light and the white dome lights. And of course the emergency instrument floodlights are going to operate as well. We're also going to have flight crew oxygen, passenger oxygen, and if installed, the uh, standby forward air stair interior and exterior operation is still possible, if your airplane has an air stair installed. In terms of the air systems, we'll have the um, AC pack valves operating, the bleed trip off lights, manual pressurization control will be possible and the cabin altitude warning horn is going to be operative. And depending on if you are flying a 737-700 or an 800, you will either have the pack trip off lights or the pack lights available. The captain's pitot probe heat is still going to be operative, but all the remainder of the anti-ice system is going to be inoperative. So the captain's, stamp, uh, the captain's speed indicator is going to remain live, but all the other ones may actually freeze up if you're flying in icing conditions. From the communication systems, we'll have the uh, flight interphone system, service interphone system, passenger address system, and the VHF radio number one operative. So we can only uh, communicate through a single radio then, but we can still talk with each other in the flight deck, with the cabin crew, and we can still make PAs to the passengers. In terms of the electrical, the standby power off light is uh, still going to be operative. But let's look at the uh, more interesting stuff now. So engines and APU. The upper display unit is going to work and the um, indications of the engines are still going to work as well. So you will have the N1, N2, fuel flow, EGT, fuel quantity, oil pressure, oil temperature and oil quantity still operating. The thrust reversers are still going to work, the right start valves, the right igniters. APU operation is also still possible, however with the APU we have a problem here. APU starts are not recommended above an altitude of 25,000 feet because they take a huge amount of uh, power out of the batteries. So, I don't have exact numbers here, but what pilots say is basically you try to start the APU three times and your batteries are empty. That's why APU starts are not recommended above 25,000 feet because they may not be successful. So, if that happens, Get your airplane down to below 25,000 feet, then start your APU, and then put the gener APU generator online as applicable. Fire protection is still going to be operative, of course. So APU and engine fire extinguisher bottles and the APU engine and engine uh, fire detection systems and the uh, cargo fire extinguishers are also going to be uh, operative. In terms of the flight instruments, the captain's um, PFD, ND, and the um, clock are still going to work. The standby instruments are, are of course still going to work. And depending on um, the equipment installed in the aircraft, the left FMC and left CDU are probably still going to work. Heading and track indications will still work, and we'll still have the um, left radio receiver for the ILS and for the GLS operative. 
Also, the uh, marker beacons and the ADF number 1 may still be working. The fuel system is mostly going to stay operative, only the um, fuel temperature indicator is going to be inoperative. So the crossfeed valve, engine fuel shutoff valves, bar fuel shutoff valves, fuel valve, cross, uh, fuel valve closed lights and the fuel quantity indicators are going to stay live. As well as the hydraulic system, so engine hydraulic shutoff valves and standby rudder shutoff valves will survive. For the landing gears, we'll only have the inboard anti-skid system operative. The anti-skid in-up light is still going to work, the park and brake, the air ground sensors and the landing gear indicator lights. And finally, for the warning systems on board the aircraft, we are going to be limited to three warning systems, which are the stall warning, oral warnings and master caution light recall. So you can see that with the um, aircraft operating only on battery power, we are severely limited. Basically, all that's going to stay working is the captain's PFD, MD, standby instruments, upper display unit, the FMC, and the um, radios on the left-hand side. The first officer is just going to get dark displays. He'll have to look over to the captain. That is uh, saving battery power, and that is uh, by the design of Boeing. So, that basically concludes our look at the electrical system on the 737MGs. Now, let's quickly summarize what's really important for you to operate the airplane. Never switch off any power source, only switch on new power sources. So, don't switch off the APU generator after engine start. Instead, turn on the engine generators. That is automatically going to put the APU generators offline. Don't disconnect the IDGs, as they cannot be reconnected. And if you do single engine taxi, a bus, a transfer bus off light should only illuminate briefly, if at all. But mostly the uh, source off light is going to indicate that automatic switching has taken place. So, with all of that said, thank you very much for listening. I hope that you found this one interesting, and I'm looking forward to see you all again on a future video. Do leave me a comment below if you've made it all the way to the end, and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so yet. And finally, if you do appreciate what I'm doing on this channel, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below. Until then, thank you very much for joining. I hope that you have found this one interesting. Thank you for bearing with me all the way to the end, and I'm looking forward to see you all in the virtual skies very soon.